All right, so uh, just. Um... This meeting is being recorded. Be quiet. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So just. Uh... No, I should. I should probably. Should it continue to be recorded? Should is that right? Uh... Are we still recording it, uh, which one? Uh, no, so no need to record it, right? Huh? You're still recording the, you're still recording anyway or something, yeah? Yes. yes. Yeah, yeah, okay. So no slides. Yeah, unlikely to be any slides, so we'll just leave, leave it out. Okay, okay, so let's just get started. All right, so, dear Ajahn, many Buddhist scriptures and texts mention people, someone become a sort of an arahant, uh, can you share how did they know? What are the yardsticks to measure? Is there any pos possibility of self-assessment? Thank you. <laughs> uh, so as I was saying before, if you're an arahant, you know that you're an arahant. This is immediate knowledge. Uh, you know that all birth has come to an end. Uh, you know, so you, you know, this is, your mind is freed. You have no doubt about it if you're an arahant. Uh, so if you have doubts, you're not an arahant. So, uh, for a, a stream enter is a bit more difficult to know. You know that something has happened. You know that there has been a revolution in your mind. Wow, the world seems upside down. What happened? Don't know, but something really profound happened. Yeah. So maybe I, either I'm a stream enter or I'm something else, but something has certainly happened. Uh, so what you would do then normally, you would go to a, a skillful teacher. Yeah, maybe, I don't know, whoever you take as a, to be a skillful teacher, maybe Ajahn Brahm or something like that, and you would say, Ajahn, I had this experience, what does it mean? And he will say, oh, yeah, you just had a nice meditation, so carry on. That's what it, usually he will say that. <laughs> and some very occasionally he might say, wow, wow, that's really cool. Yeah, you have had some really interesting insights there. So uh, best thing is to have, have a chat with an experienced teacher. The vast majority of people tend to overestimate themselves. Yeah, the number of jhana attainers in the world that have never had jhana is very large. <laughs> you know what I mean? Huh? Yeah. The, all these people who are who attain jhana, who haven't attained jhana, all the stream hunters who are not stream hunters, uh, all the arahants who are not arahants, uh, the internet arahants. Yeah, you go on the website, there's an arahant on the website, kind of a heading, not an arahant. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, that's the best way. You speak to someone who is very knowledgeable. That's usually the best way. They will have some some. Uh, I had some idea. So, yeah, basically, the stream mentor knows that there has the insight in non-self, and that's often how you would recognize it. But uh, there's many degrees of non-self insight. Uh, and sometimes it's very hard to know how deep is your insight. Uh, yeah, is it does it go all the way, or does it only go part of the way? Uh, and that is often the problem. And that's why there are so many uh, so-called stream mentors who are not really stream mentors. Uh. You have to go inside to see here. Uh, yeah. <laughs> you need to go inside to see the insight. <laughs> yes, yes, that is true. Yeah. Okay. Hmm. Will you? Should we send them to you, Venerable, if they have doubts? <laughs> Maybe you are. You can tell them. Anyway, dear Ajahn, during the retreat, we have uh, the benefit of Ajahn to guide and dissect the suttas. That sounds very clin <laughs> clinical dissect. <laughs> How can we independently dissect the suttas on our own so we can extract the essence of the Buddha's teachings? What are some good and uh, good questions to ask oneself while reading the suttas? Thank you, Sarah Times 3. Um, yeah, so some of the good questions to ask is, uh, what does this mean in my life? Yeah, What does this mean for me? How should I... Uh, how, how can I make use of this particular teaching? Yeah. And sometimes the teachings may be so profound that you may not be able to really use it directly. Yeah. But most teachings can be used in some way in your life. Yeah. The point is to use these things as guide, guidances uh, that actually have an effect in your life. So, so just reading things and enjoying it for the, you know, for the uh, Buddha's insight, you can do that, but uh, you know that is not kind of ultimately the purpose of these things. Uh, and some days that may happen, you may read a sutta which is kind of beyond you anyway, and you may just enjoy the Buddha's exposition. That is also okay here. You may read a sutta like the Mula Pariyaya Sutta, the first sutta of the Majjhima and it's very profound and it's kind of interesting, but it may be hard to really put it into practice. Uh, 
Um, but usually that's the best question to ask. What does this mean for me? Then? How do I apply Majin Mani Kaya to, yeah, okay, you read number one, okay, okay, nice sutta, I don't understand too much, but there, and then we want number two, Sabha, Sabha Sutta, all the taints, all the corruptions of the mind. And the talk starts off by talking about Yonis or Manasikara. Yeah, and this is kind of maybe the best explanation of Yonis or Manasikara in the suttas found there in the second sutta of the Majin Mani Kaya. Okay, what does it mean for me here? How do I apply this uh, in daily life? Yeah, Yonis or Manasikara. What does wise attention mean or proper attention or whatever? Uh, how in like right now, what is proper attention right now? Yeah, this kind of thing. And then you start to kind of un uh, dissect the suttas, as you say, yeah, in a in a way, and you start to read them in a way that is useful. Uh, uh, also, read them for inspiration. Sometimes, just feel inspired by the word of the Buddha. Read the Dhammapada, read the Theragatha, the Theragatha. These works of poetry are often very beautiful and very powerful, uh, and very inspiring, uh, and they drive your desire to practice precisely because they inspire you. Knowledge only goes so far. In the end, inspiration is actually more important. Uh, don't be one of those people who work incredibly, incredibly hard. Yeah? Some people work extremely hard uh, and they spend their life and often they don't have enough, don't have enough self-compassion, self-kindness, uh, self-understanding. Uh, uh, and uh, it is not about working hard, it's about working smart. Uh, and a lot of that smartness is in the quality of the heart. And working too hard sometimes means we don't have enough kindness to ourselves. Uh, and we just work hard for whatever purpose, whether it is to succeed or whatever else it is. Uh, that is not really what it is about. It's about doing things wisely. Uh, and then we're going to be on the right track. Yeah. So something like that. Um, okay, we have a few questions. And I, I promised to do every single question. So I'm going to have to be kind of a work smart and not work hard. So... <laughs> So let's see what, um, what can be done. Um, yeah, oh, pseudo session. Oh, okay, now this is six. Wow, this is what am I doing now? Okay, aha. Uh -huh. uh. mm. Okay, so this should be, should be okay. So, dear Ajahn, is it possible for a lay person to attain stream entry? Um, mm. Is it possible for lay people to attain samadhi? Thanks and warm respects. That's very nice. Thanks and warm respects. I like that. Uh, um, so, is it possible for a lay person to attain stream entry? The, ans the uh, short answer is yes. The long answer is more complicated. Uh. <laughs> So it is often not about what is possible, it is often about what is reasonable. And that is actually a much more interesting question. Is it reasonable? It depends what kind of lay life you live. Yeah? If you live a lay life that is really geared toward, it's, it's almost like a monastic life, then the answer may be yes. If you live a celibate life, you live by yourself, you kind of live really apart from everyone else, you spend almost all your time contemplating the Dhamma, practicing meditation all the time. I know some lay people who live like that, and they are sometimes they are more monastic than the monastics. Yeah, you, you know what I mean? Because they actually live incredible seclusion. Not all, not all lay people, not all monastics live in incredible seclusion. But some of these lay people are just extraordinary. Yeah? I, I know some of them. So then it is, then it becomes possible. Yeah. But uh, normally, if you want to maximize the chances of stream entry, usually the best way is to become a monastic. That's why the Buddha laid down the monastic monasticism. Otherwise, what would the point of laying it down? So it is possible. So don't. Uh, so what if it is impossible for you to become a monastic for whatever reasons? Uh, then you have to make the most of lay life, yeah, and uh, just make the most of it. Don't worry too much if it is possible or not uh, to become a stream entry. It is possible. Do what you can to come as close as you possibly can. That is what matters. So put in all the causes. Don't look for the results. If you look for the results, you're going to destroy the path. Look for the causes instead. How can I be more kind? How can I do the right thing? How can I think in the right way? How can I inspire myself? Don't allow the deep teachings of the Buddha to become a source of sadness because it, is, it sounds so deep and it sounds like so depressing sometimes, these teachings. Please don't do that. Uh, this is always a danger on the path that we kind of grab these things the wrong way. Do things that brighten up the mind, that make you happy. 
Remember that you are on this path, your future is bright, you're heading in the right direction. Do some metta practice, do the practice of a, uh, have compassion for all the beings in the world. See the good in other people, because there is a lot of goodness in the world. And when you see the goodness in other people, then your mind brightens up as a consequence. So uh, it is possible, do your very best. Is it possible for people to attend samadhi? Yes, that is absolutely possible. Uh, certainly you can go easily go quite easily go to the stages when you see nimittas, you see bright lights in the mind. A lot of lay people have these experiences, yeah? And uh, as I said today during the talk downstairs, you are in really good company if you can do that. The Buddha also was attaining this kind of samadhi, and he was kind of struggling to get that right. He had to make it work properly. So you're really on the right track if you can do that kind of thing. So. Yeah, so that is already great, yeah? And then you get reborn in the heavenly realm and you carry on the practice in the heavenly realm. There you are, little deva, yeah? Wandering around, yay, I'm a deva now. This is really cool, yeah? All, all this happiness and I can still carry on practicing the Dhamma. So then you, then you are on the right track, yeah? So just do your very best in this life. And that is what matters the most. Don't be too concerned about what is possible and what is not because that will normally just distract you from the actual practice. Dear Arjan, in Ajahn Brahma's book, The Jhanas, it is mentioned that during deep meditation there will come a time when one is only aware of the breath and in deeper states the breath also disappears. Question number one, oh, oh it's always bad, question number one. How many questions? Okay. <laughs> you think there's only like ten things in here but each one has about four or five questions and I remember once there was somebody, I got this note, there was 13 or 14 questions on one page. I thought it was only one person asking questions and there uh, was, but anyway this is not so bad. What is meant by the breath disappears? Does it mean we stop breathing physically or it's only the mind's perception? So it can mean different things depending on the context. So breath disappearing can mean that you are not in jhana or not in samadhi, uh, but uh, yeah, the, the mindfulness is not sharp enough to be able to catch the breath. Uh, yeah? So the breath kind of looks like it's gone, uh, but actually it is still there. It's just kind of uh, you are a bit dull or you haven't got the sharpness or whatever it is, you can't see the breath. Uh, this is one way that the breath disappears. Now that way, what do you do then? Well, the, there's different, different things you can do. One thing you can do is just hang out and wait, yeah? And just feel the uh, peace, feel, enjoy what you have, enjoy the peace and see what happens. Uh, and uh, at some point the breath will reappear or, or you will go deeper into the meditation, yeah? So if the breath disappears, no need to panic, just chillax. The body knows how to breathe without your input. Uh, so you can take it, be absolutely sure that you are not going to die, yeah? Just like when you fall asleep, the body knows how to breathe, right? So you don't have to be afraid of falling asleep at night. Uh, so that is one kind of breath disappearing. Uh, another way of kind of using it if the breath disappears like that is to kind of breathe a bit intentionally so the breath comes back again. Whatever you feel comfortable with. Uh, another breath where the breath disappears is because you enter a very deep state of samadhi like the jhanas. The breath is no longer perceptible. You have left the five sense world and you can only experience the breath through the five senses. The five senses are gone, you can't experience the breath anymore. So the body is still breathing, but you have no idea what is going on. You have left that reality. Then you can go all the way to the fourth jhana, the breath actually stops. There is no more breathing at all. So how is that possible? Well, that is possible because the body becomes so peaceful, so tranquil, this is how I understand anyway, that the metabolism stops. In other words, the cells of the body stop burning fuel. You don't need any fuel anymore because you're completely peaceful. And if you don't burn any fuel, the metabolism stops. You don't need oxygen. If you don't need oxygen, the blood, the count, oxygen count in your blood is going to be constant. No need to breathe because you don't need any more oxygen. Yeah? So that's kind of the, the other way of, of, uh, that this happens. Uh, I think maybe the heart also stops, yeah, because you don't need any heartbeat. What's the point of the heart beating? Yeah? No point, yeah. If the oxygen is there, there's nothing to be exchanged, no metabolism, there's no kind of waste products, and there's no oxygen needs to go in. So probably your heart stops. Yeah. That's kind of cool, isn't it? Yeah? And everything stops. Yeah? And that's uh, sort of that's what happens in these deep stages of samadhi. Anyway, cool or not, question number two. But in Ajahn Brahm's same book, he mentioned 
that one meditator was deep in meditation that he actually had no breathing and his wife thought he had died. He was taken to hospital and uh, shook, shaken back to life. Yeah, you have this kind of, this, this kind of whatever they call that you stick on the chest and, and kind of people get back to. Um, what is Ajahn's comment on this? Uh, um, hmm, not sure. Um, I think that uh, uh, maybe his breath was very, very subtle, but if he was completely stopped breathing, he should have been in the fourth jhana. And uh, my recollection is that he still had some degree of awareness, actually. And so he wasn't really, he probably wasn't in jhana at all. Uh, but uh, maybe he still, his breath was so subtle they couldn't register it. It's possible. Yeah, something like that. Uh, um, that would be my, my take on that. Uh, but he obviously had a very deep meditation. Uh, and so I think the story is basically right. Basically, that's what happened. Uh, so, uh, interesting story here. Yeah. Okay. Wait. Wow. <laughs> okay. So let's have a look. Sukihotu Anjan. First of all, thank you so very much for bringing the Buddha closer to us. More importantly, thank you for your clear reading of the Buddha's teachings, uh, giving context and background to the suttas. I find this helps tremendously in understanding the message of the suttas and in remembering the suttas better. Dear Ajahn, I have a question on duality. I've attended several talks where the speaker tried to explain duality, and all of them seem to suggest that duality is a bad thing and that we all live in a duality world. This has got me all confused. Dear Ajahn, did the Buddha mention anything about duality or singularity? Is the understanding of duality and singularity essential on the spiritual path? Why do people teach duality? Is Nibbana singularity? Thank you so much, Ajahn. <laughs> uh, let me just read the PS as well. The Potalia Sutta talks about equanimity based on diversity and equanimity based on unity. Are they the same as duality and singularity? Okay, so the, the idea of uh, duality often comes from the idea of the, uh, the Vedas and the Hindu scriptures, uh, Vedanta. Uh, and uh, there's a very, you know, very famous uh, uh, meditation school within uh, the Vedas called the Advaita Vedanta. And Advaita means non-duality, quite literally. Uh, Advaita is a Sanskrit word, which means it's very similar to what you find, Advita or something like that in Pali. It means non-duality, not two. And in Buddhism, this is uh, often called Ekata in the suttas. Ekata means oneness. Yeah? And oneness uh, is a word that was used in that particular sutta, the Potalya Sutta. It is also found elsewhere. It is found in the uh, Chula Sunyata Sutta, the shorter sutta on emptiness, Majjhimalika 121. It talks about the oneness of mind based on various kinds of perceptions. Uh, so you have the oneness of mind based on the perception of earth, the oneness of mind based on the higher things. Uh, and that is an idea like non-duality. Uh, and non-duality in the um, uh, suttas basically is, are things like the jhana states. Uh, First jhana, a little bit of duality. First, second jhana, non-duality. It's called chit, it's eko de buddha, become one. In other words, there's only one thing that you experience. That one thing is there all the time. There's no change in your experience. All you experience is bliss. Nothing apart from bliss going on for a long, long period of time, and there's nothing else there. That's why it's called non-duality or singularity, if you like. Duality means that there is more things happening in your mind. Yeah? As, uh, yeah? So like now you see many things, you hear things, all kind of stuff going on. That means the mind is not non-dual, it is dual because it's moving a lot, moving all the time. It is not staying with one single object, one single thing. Yeah? So duality means there's many things going on. You can call it, uh, instead of duality, you can call it many, what is the many, man, I'm not sure how that goes, duality, I'm not sure how that works out in terms of language. But anyway, yeah, many, many something. Yeah. And so that is really the idea. So before you get into a deep jhana, especially the second jhana, it is all dual. It is all duality. It is not necessarily bad. Yeah, we have to live in the, the dual world, so you make the most out of that duality. But uh, ekata, non-duality, is far more powerful. That is when the mind regains its energy. 
all the duality in the world, all the diversity in the world, diversity maybe the word I was looking for, all the diversity scatters the energy of the mind uh, because it's going everywhere, going to different kind of things, going to this sense, to that sense, uh, seeing a multiplicity of things, uh, and all of that means that the mind loses energy. When you come, go into a jhana state, uh, you become incredibly energized. Uh, I, I, always, I always find it so beautiful the way Ajahn Brahm, he doesn't say these things anymore, but he used to say that you become like a nuclear reactor. Now. <laughs> yeah, so if you want to know what it's like to be a nuclear reactor, just enter jhana, then you know you have a direct experience of being, <laughs> being a nuclear reactor. Yeah. Yeah, you become, in other words, you become incredibly powerful. You feel like this kind of uh, yeah, power source. We just hook you up to the net and you will power all of KL after that. Yeah? <laughs> You're a nuclear reactor. <laughs> and so this, is, uh, this gives an idea of what uh, you know, this is. And I, I, you, know, you hear this, sometimes you listen to people who get into very deep meditation and they will tell you that. It's like the energy is just absolutely outrageous. It, it feels like you are, have superpowers. You feel like God. This is why people say that these states are like God states. Yeah? You become God. You become unified with God. And it's very easy to get very conceited about it unless you have the Buddhist teachings to remind you that it is impermanent. Maybe you are God, but only for a short while. Then you come back as a human again afterwards. Uh, just a downer, yeah? I was God, now I'm human. Wow, that's, <laughs> that's terrible. <laughs> but this is kind of what, what happens in these things. Uh, this is kind of the power you have, the bliss, the unity, the non-duality, the energy, the mindfulness, the ability to see clearly all of these things coming together in one thing. Uh, that is how you can become enlightened because the mind is so incredibly powerful uh, Anyway, I said I was going to finish, I better hurry up. Uh, Ajahn, death is inevitable. Yes, exactly, you are on the right track. Yeah. <laughs> However, I am not ready or prepared for it yet. So do I still contemplate death, Sadhu? Absolutely. It is by contemplating death that you will become ready for it. Yeah? So contemplate death, but do it in a way that doesn't scare you or doesn't make you feel kind of, you know, ill at ease or whatever. Do it in a way that is natural. And one of the ways of doing that is to, to start with in the future. You know you're going to die, right? So you have said this already. So kind of bring it a little bit closer. Okay, maybe you think, okay, I, I may have another 30 years. So start bringing it forward to 20 years, 10 years, one year. I may be dead in one year, yeah? Then six months, one month. Maybe dead in a week. Yeah? So you gradually bring it closer and closer until you get to the point where you are ready to die on the next breath, which is what the Buddha was saying in that particular sutta. Huh? So you are gentle with yourself. You know what you can take. You understand what is possible for you to do. Huh? And as you do that, you make it real. Huh? And then one day you are ready to die. Huh? Yeah? Ready to die now. Huh? Good. Huh? Dear Ajahn, Buddha told us, don't involve in the five industry for the living, human trafficking, meat, weapon, intoxicants, and poisons. Is the above the correct understanding? Yes, it is the correct understanding. If yes, can we say the Buddha indirectly told us, don't kill animals and don't eat them when there is no demand, there is no supply? Um, did he say that indirectly? Um, I, if you look at those particular five industries or trades, yeah, it is the meat trade. It basically means that you are directly involved in killing human beings. That's usually what it means. The same thing with, no, sorry, animals, I mean, killing animals. <laughs> you don't want to eat human meat. <laughs> and uh, the weapons and intoxicants, they, obviously that could be very much involved in killing humans, right? And so I would say it is more like Killing, actually being the one who kills animals, that is, the, that is the biggest problem. Does it tell us not to eat? And certainly tells us not to kill them. Does it tell us not to eat them? Because when there's no demand, there's no supply. Um, he, he doesn't really say that. And so I think the point is that the kamma of eating meat and, and being a, a source of demand is far less than actually the actual act of killing yeah? The actual act of killing is a much harsher thing, yeah? I don't know if you have ever killed an animal, but I remember when I was a young 
man, I was a teenager. I had, someone gave me this air gun. I should never have given me that air gun. And I remember aiming this air gun at a bird, and then I pulled the trigger, and I happened to hit the bird. That was the worst moment in my life. It was felt really, really, really terrible. Man. And uh, <laughs> and I think even thinking back now, it feels really, really not very nice. Uh, uh, and that the killing just feels really bad. But when you eat the sausage, it doesn't have that feeling with it at all. There's a very different feeling to actually doing the killing. Uh, and so I think the kamma is far, far worse in, in being the killer than in eating meat. Uh, however, does that mean that it is good to be a vegetarian? Uh, I think so. It is good to be a vegetarian. It's still good not to be part of the meat industry. Fewer animals get killed, yeah? A lot of problems in the world arise from this. So if you want to be a vegetarian, I would say great, yeah, good. And I think, yeah, I think that's great. But it's not an absolute demand on the Buddhist path. May I know why you choose to be pescatarian? Well, the reason is because I, did, I, I tried to stop eating meat. And, uh, but then I, I thought it would be good to eat some fish. I, and actually, when I think about it, maybe it's not such a good idea. Maybe I should move, go from pescatarian to vegetarian. But uh, so far, I have kind of been eating fish, and that's why I am there. I think maybe because I thought I would need some, need some of the iron or proteins or whatever. Maybe it's just a mistaken view, but uh, that's what I thought. So, um, yeah, that was kind of my idea. And also, everybody keeps, somehow, the word has spread that I like salmon. <laughs> so I don't know why. So wherever I go, I get, always get salmon. Yeah, I, I can kind of eat salmon non-stop if I wanted to. Yeah. And to I, and it's probably the only thing I need to eat is salmon, and I can drop everything else. I can probably even drop the coffee and just eat salmon all the time. Yeah. But <laughs> so uh, and it's it kind of you know, and so it, come, it, it almost becomes hard to stop. Yeah, it becomes like a self-fulfilling kind of thing because everyone brings you salmon, and you feel a bit obliged to eat it. Yeah. But because if people bring you that out of kindness and you say, no, I'm not going to eat it, it feels kind of harsh. Yeah? So you think, OK, you bring the salmon, OK, I have some salmon. And, uh, and uh, so you, uh, this is one of the things about being a, being a monk as well. You, know, you, you are on the receiving end of a lot of kindness. You have to treat what you get respectfully. Yeah? Not to do that is actually very harsh, and very unkind. Uh, and so you try to do your best to receive things in a respectful way. Yeah? And you try to kind of see how can I, you know, do that in an appropriate way. Otherwise, it's, uh, there's no gratitude there in how you receive people's uh, kindness. Uh, so that is uh, also important. Uh, so anyway, I will um, see what happens. Future is uncertain. <laughs> mm, okay. Uh, okay. Three of the most rem revered monks of our lifetime went through some of the most severe suffering in the final years. K. Sridhamananda, four years, Thich Nhat Hanh, one year, Ajahn Shah, nine years. They were bedridden or immobile and needed endless medical treatment. My question is, how come their super good kama had not saved them from such severe suffering? My personal insight into this after this last lifetime, final deep suffering. My personal insight into this is, after this lifetime of final deep suffering, all past life kamma erased. They could all become arahants in the next life. Saru times three. Um, I, yes, so um, this is true and it's something that you wonder about, but you, you actually realize that uh, it's a very common thing for people to have a lot of suffering in the last years of their life. It's very, very common. And I think it's very useful to be aware of that because sometimes we don't understand how much suffering it is to get really old. And uh, so I think that uh, in Thich Nhat Hanh, one year, was it, was it seven or one? I'm not sure. Seven or one. I'm not sure what, which one it is. Uh, maybe seven years. Uh, but Kesri Damananda, four years. Four years is not a long time. Yeah? Four years of being bedridden is not considered a very long time. I was, when we had this last global conference in Singapore, that was in December, I was there, we had all of the Singaporean doctors, and they were talking about the end of life treatment, etc. And they were talking about the kind of usual, uh, usual way to dying for most people. And they were saying, on average, a person is kind of bedridden and out of it for about 10 years. This is like the average. 
And when I heard that, I thought, wow, this now kind of the idea of why old age is suffering and problem kind of became clear to me. Ten years, yeah, that's a long time. And you're basically immobile, there's nothing you can do. So old age is very often like this. There are not that many people who just pass away, you know, in their sleep and they die, and that's it, they're finished. And this is kind of kind of rare. Most people go through long periods of uh, when they are really out of it. So I think that these monks, even though they were very good monks, uh, they just had the, probably, they were just humans. And because you're human, this is kind of very often what you go through. Even if you are Ajahn Shah, even if you are an Aryan, even if you're doing really, really well, still you have to go through these kind of things. And needing, as you say, endless medical treatment. Um, so uh, could they all become Arahants? Some of them may have been Arahants already. Yeah, I don't... Don't, I don't really know Kesu Damananda at all. Ajahn Brahm knew him a little bit. Uh, some people say Ajahn Shah was an Arahant. Uh, Thich Nhat Hanh, again, I, I don't know him very, very much about him. Uh, but, um, yeah, so I think it's just the nature of being human. I think that's the main thing here that's going on. Uh, and uh, that, um, that's just life, basically, for you. Uh, and life is difficult. Uh, even the Buddha became old and frail in his final uh, days, yeah? even though he didn't have this kind of suffering, even though he was walking, that's kind of impressive, he almost walked to the last place that he stayed yeah, on his deathbed uh, at uh, Kushinara. Um, still, he had times, you know, he was talking about his body falling apart, there's a sutta about that in the Sangyutta Nikaya, you know, the body becoming wrinkly and flaccid and kind of just not really, you know, kind of falling apart. Um, and having severe illnesses towards the end and all of these kind of things. So even the Buddha had to bear with some of the problems of the human body. Uh, so let alone uh, lesser people now. Dear Ajahn, today you spoke about the Buddha was very courageous to search for the solution to soul suffering. If not for his courage, he would not have discovered the Dhamma and shared it with the rest of the world. How can I... Uh, have courage for myself so that I show, show up for myself and others uh, and that I don't give up when time gets tough. Um, so how can you have the courage? Well, you can have the, the courage is really just about understanding the Dhamma in the right way. Yeah? Understanding that um, doing what is right, that is what creates your future. Yeah? And uh, if you don't do what is right, if you don't have the courage when things get a bit tough, uh, then you are not building up your future in a good way. You are kind of chickening out. So you just have to understand that uh, when you, sometimes you just have to do the right thing and not care about what others think and just forget about others because other people don't understand anyway. People praise you for stupid things and they blame you for stupid things. Why do we listen to other people's praise and blame? It's kind of, what do they know anyway? Yeah, if someone blames you in your company, what do they know about what is really worthwhile? They blame you for some kind of stupid thing, even if you have a really good heart. You should tell them, be quiet, you don't understand. That's what you should say. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a good person, don't we get it? What's wrong with you? <laughs> so they blame us for stupid things, and then they praise us also for stupid things, yeah, it's for, to control us or whatever it is. And so um, and remember that other people's opinions are really largely irrelevant. Uh, only ask Ajahn Brahm. Yeah? Ask, say, Ajahn Brahm, am I okay? Guaranteed, he will say you are okay. Yeah? Almost guaranteed. Uh, because Ajahn Brahm always sees the best in people. Yeah? And uh, so uh, then you get more courage because you understand that actually other people's opinions are irrelevant. Uh, they don't know. They don't understand what is important in life. Very few people understand what is really important and what matters. What is a really good character and what is a bad character. And then you build up the courage to do what is right. You um, understand what is important in life and what is irrelevant. Keep on listening to them. I come back to the suttas. Yeah, brainwash yourself. Yay, my mind is getting clean and beautiful by the brainwashing powder of the Buddha. <laughs> Okay. Dear Ajahn Ramali, regarding the conduct of gratefulness and thankfulness, uh, if one is not grateful to another who has done some good deeds to one due to some reasons, <laughs> then one will end up in hell as per the Akatan, Akatanyuta Sutta. Isn't this the punishment? Uh, is, isn't this punishment or harsh? 
I can understand it if it involves one's parents, Ajahn Brahm and Ajahn Brahm Mahali and the Lord Buddha. Yeah, I'm not sure if I should be in that company. But anyway, whatever. Have a safe luck to Perth. Okay, thank you. So remember what that sutta says. Yeah, you have to read carefully because the sutta is, um, uh, is, says more than just gratitude. It says that if you are bad in bad conduct by body, speech, and mind, and you are ungrateful, yeah? So those three first ones are probably the most important ones. Uh, those are the ones that really matter. So if you have all of those bad things, just because you are a little bit ungrateful, especially maybe for to one or two people, because some people may do kind acts, but they also may do bad acts towards us. So, and so it may be difficult to feel gratitude. That's okay, yeah? Don't, be, don't try to be too perfect, uh, because then you just create even more suffering for yourself. Uh. So you do your best. Uh. Sometimes you don't succeed. That's fine. Uh, yeah? In generally speaking, have a bit of gratitude if you can. Uh. But the most important thing is to live well by body, speech, and mind. Uh. Dear Ajahn, early you shared an article on parenting where the parents should just love the children. Uh, love them regardless. Uh, uh, could you please share the link? Thank you, Ajahn. Uh, I can. Not sure how to share it with you. Maybe come up afterwards or maybe I will send it to Bob, email it to Bobby or something and Bobby can share it. Uh, maybe that's the best way. So I will put it over here for remembrance. Dear Ajahn, I tend to be the type that needs answers to everything or a clear plan to go through or be able to clearly know the outcome for every decision I make. Uh, it is best not to have to clearly know the outcome of every decision you make. You won't be able to make many decisions. So. Is it possible to know the outcome of every decision? Yeah, it's just impossible. And I like sometimes Ajahn Brahm's idea. He's, he says he, Ajahn Brahm is an incredibly wise person, yeah? and sometimes he says things that are really nice, yeah, and really contrary to what almost everyone else says. Uh, and he will say, it doesn't matter what you choose. Uh, what matters is how you implement the choice that you make. Yeah. And that's a really, really nice idea, because sometimes we just can't know whether something is right or wrong. Sometimes it's like a toss-up of a coin, yeah, heads or tails. I actually don't know what is right. Should I live in KL or should I live in Singapore? Don't know. Should I live in Perth or should I live in Norway? Don't know. Should I, what should I do? Should I be a Buddhist or should I be a Christian? Actually, that one I know. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> should I? So they, I... And the Buddha gave some really good advice on how to make decisions, yeah? Knowing the outcome, the best advice that he gave, and this is really, really good advice. What is the choice that is going to make you grow the most in good qualities and go down in bad qualities? That is a choice you should make. And that is a choice of everything in life, whether you should get married or not, whether you should be, uh, uh, live here or live there, which Buddhist society you should be part of, what kind of job you should have, what kind of education, everything should be measured through that lens. Yeah? So for example, if you're going to take a new job, okay, so this new job, so what will it do for my spiritual life? Okay, it has a little bit less stress than the previous one, which means I will be maybe more time for myself, I'll be a bit more kind as a result. So maybe this is a good for my spiritual life. Or maybe you're the person who thrives under pressure. Maybe you like to have a really high pressure job, yeah? That makes you even better as a person, maybe, yeah? So you think carefully about what, how it is going to affect your spiritual life. The spiritual life should always be the number one priority. Everything should be measured through the lens of the spiritual life. Then you are on the right track, yeah? So um, that, that, that makes it easier to make decisions because then you have a clear... A criterion for how to decide. But, uh, okay, <laughs> you have taught us that it is not possible that life is full of uncertainties and questions. Yes, excellent. Well done. Yeah, you have certainly you have uh, got that right. How can I live life in accordance with nature or as they say, go with the flow and yet not be reckless and foolish? So, yes, yeah, so you, do, as I said, you make your choices in life according to what is going to be the most spiritually powerful, yeah? And uh, usually what that means is just simply to be kind, simply to be caring, simply to do your very best. You know, one of the nice, another uh, nice advice on, on the, 
the Dhamma that Ajahn Brahm gives, and he gives that to doctors usually. Because if when you're a doctor, there's a lot of uh, pressure to cure people. Yeah, you have to cure. As Ajahn Brahm says you cannot always cure. Doctors know that. Sometimes you just can't because the patient is too sick. But what you can always do is care. Yeah, and this is always true in life. We cannot always cure. We cannot always do the right thing. We, sometimes we can't get our children to get straight A's. It's impossible because sometimes they are dum dums. You can't, you can't get straight A's, no matter how hard they try. And so we have to love the dum-dums too. They can become good people, yeah? If they can't be anything else, at least they can become good monks and nuns at the very least, yeah? If the, I'm being silly now. I don't mean that. I mean the, the, the smart ones should become the monks. That's what I really want to say. Yeah? <laughs> and, <laughs> and so, yeah, so this is what you do. Look at the, look at the causes, not the results, sir. Yeah, the plan, the plan, throw out the plan, because you don't know where you're going to end up anyway. No, no plans. Forget about the outcomes. Forget about the answers. There often there aren't any answers. The only answer is, put in the causes now. Right now, the cause is to be kind. Right now, the cause is to think in the right way. Right now, the cause is to incline your mind in the right direction. Yeah, what is, the causes are always, that is what is always the cause. That is what matters. And then the good outcomes will come regardless. And the good outcomes does not mean that, uh, you know, you get a promotion in your job. The good outcome doesn't mean you become wealthy. The good outcome doesn't mean people like you. The good outcome means you come closer to Nibbana. That's what is, that is the only outcome that matters. Uh, and then uh, usually, actually, it means you will have success. Usually it means you will have many friends because kind people have many friends. Uh, yeah, people like Ajahn Brahm, he has to push people away all the time. Say, please, too many friends, go away. I don't want so many friends. And uh, so that is what happens usually. Yeah. So uh, something like that. Yeah, please don't be reckless. That's certainly not the right uh, thing. Um, be caring. That is the right thing. Yeah. Dear Ajahn, five years ago you gave me a precious gift, a gift that ignited my interest in the suttas. Thank you. Well, wow, that's very nice to hear, so thank you for sharing that with me. I have found joy in reading and learning from the suttas. This retreat, Anapanasati Sutta, inspires me to continue my practice with renewed zeal. In the Mahanama Sutta, your poignantly and tear-jerking story about meeting the Buddha and experiencing his compassion deeply touches my heart. I now understand how to recollect the Buddha, the realized one, sadhu times three. Okay, that is wonderful. Then. To ensure that I stay connected with the Dhamma, I have enrolled myself in the weekly Sutta and Pali classes. My question is, how can I reach out to you for clarification when I have questions regarding the Sutta and Pali studies? By email, question mark. Hmm. <laughs> Thank you very much. Much wishing us on good health and body and mind as always. Okay. Um, I don't usually give out my email address because uh, I tend to get too many emails. That's kind of one of the problems of being in a kind of a position of a senior monk. Lots of people would like to send you emails uh, and uh, that can become problematic. So I try to kind of, uh, with the BGF, I have kind of one that goes through one lens. And that's Bobby is kind of the, uh, the kind of the, you have to kind of, Things go via Bobby, right? And then uh, he kind of, uh, so he's the only person who gets my, well, not quite the only person, but close to the only person I really. So uh, I prefer not to get emails. Uh, but instead, what you can do, uh, I don't know if you listen to the Dhamma talks we give at the DSWA on Friday nights. If you do, it is possible to put questions into the chat, yeah, into the, that one. And uh, you can actually get your questions answered that way. So I give fairly regular Dhamma talks there, maybe once a month or something. Uh, and uh, then you can actually ask me there if you, if you want to. Uh, that's one possibility. Uh, there is also, uh, there's also possible to send questions to the BSWA and other monks may answer. Some of the other monks are really great. Yeah? It is not really, some of them are just as knowledgeable as I am and they can give you really good answers. Uh, I don't think it has to be anything to do with, with me. It can be many, many other monks are, are great. But um, it's, yeah, so, um, and then, you know, you will see me around occasionally and you can ask questions of me when you see me around, wherever that might be. Yeah. 
So I, that's the best I can do. I really don't want to give up my email address to everyone because it's too much dukkha for me. Yeah. So please, uh, out of compassion. <laughs> okay, two last questions. I'll just do those even though we're a little bit on overtime. Dear Adzan, how to make my right choices when it's overwhelmed with pain, illness, debility, abuse, and betrayal by family? Thanks, Adzan. Um, how to make the right choices? Okay, so it would sound to me that maybe you should uh, leave some of these families behind and maybe seek elsewhere. Yeah, if this is the family you have, it is not probably a suitable family for you. Huh? So maybe you need to get a divorce if you have a very bad wife or husband, huh? and maybe you need to kind of uh, you know take the BGF as your family instead. Huh? Yeah, come here, hang out at the BGF. Do some nice work, get some good friends here, some wholesome things. Uh, sometimes you just have to go in a different direction. You have to dare to make the really hard choices in life. Uh, if we allow ourselves to be abused and betrayed, uh, then all we're doing is really allowing too much suffering in our life. Too much suffering destroys your ability to practice the path properly. So don't be afraid sometimes of taking drastic actions. Uh, sometimes it is the only way forward. Uh, so um, I, never, I never would suggest to do this straight away. I don't know how long this betrayal has been going on for. If it hasn't been going on for too long, maybe fairly recently, then you can try to sort it out. But if it has been going on for a long, long time, then usually it is time to uh, do something else because you can usually judge it by the length of time that it will also continue long into the future. If it existed long time in the past, very likely it will go long into the future. Yeah? This feeling that things will change soon is usually just an illusion. Everybody has this feeling and then they stay on and on and on and on and after many, many years, finally they realize I should have left many, many years ago. Uh, that is kind of a common feeling. Uh, so uh, don't make these decisions uh, too readily, but also if you understand that there is no future here, then do it. Uh, it, sometimes it can be useful to go use a counsellor. I don't know if the BGF has counsellors that can be help out with these sort of difficult things. Sit down with a third person to try to talk it through, see if anything can be done. That can usually be a nice intermediary step. Sometimes when relationships are really difficult, you need a third party to see clearly what is happening. Because it's very hard to, after a while, you get so blocked in the old habits in the relationship, you cannot see the way out yourself anymore. You need a third party to help you out. Uh, yeah? And that's good. Important to use that. Uh, there's, no, uh, there's nothing has gone wrong if you use a third party in that way. Anyway, best of luck. Last question. Okay. Suki Hontu Ardane. I have been and am going through a difficult and challenging situation. Currently looking after my mum who is having depressions and passive aggressor. And this whole week spending time studying and learning the suttas with Ajahn and all the Kalanamitas has been uplifting, joyous, and it gave the mind some rest from facing the daily challenging situation. And as such there is great sadness knowing that today is the last day. Reason being, I'll be on my own again. Hence, sometimes I feel uh, walking this path is lonely as there is no family support. In addition, the challenging situation intensifies when I'm trying to balance filial piety and trying to have compassion for myself and my immediate family, my husband and children. I've been trying to apply Ajahn's instructions to have kindness and gratitude and to understand that the other party and myself too are stuck in our own conditioning. Uh, it's easy to remember the teaching with Ajahn around, but the mind has a tendency to revert back to default mode. It gets tiring to redirect the mind. Above is my little sharing and feedback, Ajahn. Also a realization. I have attachment to this suit and <laughs> meditation retreat. <laughs> okay, oh no. My sincere thanks and metta to Ajahn. Okay, so yes, I, I can uh, see that it is hard. I have no doubt that it is difficult. And, uh, and uh, it is easy to kind of give advice and often very difficult to put it into practice. Uh, uh, I have found in my own life, you know, you may think that when you're a monk everything is easy, but actually it is not quite the case. As a monk you also have to deal with people, and the people are difficult, 
And uh, this is always the case. Even when you're a monk, there are difficult monks around as well. And I'm sure there are different nuns as well. Is it other difficult nuns or are all the nuns really nice? Or is it either, or is it, is it different? You don't deal with it. Like, that's why you live by yourself, live on your own. Okay, very wise. Okay. So, live, live on. This is the nice thing about being a monastic. You can live completely by yourself, don't have to deal with all these things. And so what, I, so what you have to do is to remember that this too will pass. Yeah? If you have a difficult mum, she will die one day. Yeah? And when she eventually dies, uh, then you will be very grateful that you did the right thing to support her. Uh, yeah? because, and, and things happen so fast. Suddenly before you know it, she is gone. Uh, you don't know how long she's going to be around. Uh, and uh, if you use this opportunity to give her support while she's still there, you will feel happy afterwards. At the same time, don't overdo it. Uh, Know that quality time is more important than quantity time. Filial piety does not mean that you have to be around at all times. It means that when you are there, you do your very best to be supportive. Yeah? So give her, um, know that you can give better, make, you can be more caring if you are in a good frame of mind than if you do it too much. So it's okay not to do it too much. Share the burden with other people, with your brothers and sisters. Uh, with maybe you have, if, I don't know what your financial resources are, but maybe you have, can afford to have someone to care a little bit for your mom. Yeah? That is okay. I don't think there's any problem with that at all to do that. Uh, you have to look after yourself. Otherwise, uh, uh, you are letting yourself down as well. If you look after yourself, you can look after your mom. If you look after your mom in the wise way, you can also look after yourself. Uh, so uh, don't be too trapped by ideas at how it should be done. Uh, try to think in new ways to make, find a nice balance in your life. Come back to the BGF. Come back to the Kalyanamitas. Use the internet. One of the great things about the internet is that now you can have Kalyanamitas around the world. world yeah? You can have Kalyanamitas in Perth. You can see, at least, at least you can see us down there occasionally when we give talks and things. Yeah? Use those opportunities to lift up your spirits and kind of help you forward. And as you do that, then you are supporting yourself and supporting everyone around you. So just gradually go slowly. Sometimes take a step back, reflect. What can I do differently? Can I do things in a different way? Can I add some quality to all of this? Yeah? And then you will find new avenues. Suddenly new avenues open up. You think, wow, this is another way. I haven't really thought about this before. And then gradually you start to see the light and you start to move forward. The biggest danger in life is that we think the present will always last into the future. Remember what I said about that research that had been done, that uh, we always think the present will just be a, con the future will be a continuation of the present. Uh, we cannot really see that the, uh, the future changing in the same way as the past has changed and become the present. Uh, and so we tend to be stuck into a certain perception. Uh, and that's why things often seem much worse than they actually are. Uh, usually change happens. Uh, New avenues open up, and suddenly the light comes back in again, yeah? And you see opportunities you have never had before. Remember that. This too will pass, yeah? One day it will all be over, and then, uh, you know, yeah, all over that, yeah, whatever, whatever that means. It can mean different things for different people. Anyway, I wish you the very best of luck, yeah? and uh, try to use the wisdom to the best of your ability, and then hopefully you, you will find a way forward in that. So now is the time, I think, Bobby, I think I've gone a little bit over the time, but now we can have a, a short feedback session. If we want, if anyone has thought of anything they want to say, um, or you want to write written feedback to Bobby, or whatever you want to do, um, I don't know. Maybe Ni Warren, it's better if you take charge of the feedback <laughs> session, I think. Too. I find it a bit awkward. So. <laughs> no, I think I think one suggestion is uh, perhaps we'll, uh, keep it simple. Uh, one, one minute or less, just say what is one thing that uh, you took away. That means I tap out, you know, I took away back. What is one thing? And maybe then one suggestion what for Ajahn to consider, you know, in the future workshops. Would that be one of the ways? Yeah. So maybe I start from maybe from me, and maybe for me the biggest takeaway for me is the uh, that right view is far more powerful than mindfulness alone. I think that helped me 
a lot to inform my meditation practice and also my daily life practice. So that helped me a lot. That's my takeaway. Uh, one small suggestion, if I may, uh, I noticed that in the BSWA workshops, you have this uh, in-between time where after lunch, people come back and do a little bit of discussion and then they sort of then present and then you sort of listen and then just, so that may be something you might want to consider for the future. Are you taking notes, Bobby? Yes. Yeah, great. Okay, thanks. <laughs> well, <that's, laughs> thank, thank you, Bobby. That's very kind of you. I appreciate no. that. Okay. Uh, yeah. And how much time, Arjun, do you want to do this for? It's up to Bob. Bob is the boss. I, I'm just uh, I'm a slave right now, so I just... Because uh, <laughs> Bobby, Bobby will maximize, you know. My, <laughs> All right, uh, another feedback, perhaps, from anyone? Yeah, yeah that, that's up to Bobby. Yeah, that's, again, Bobby's the boss. Okay, Bobby say okay. <laughs> <laughs> and it, maybe one or two more verbal ones that, that maybe it'll be nice for Ajahn to hear if there is. Yeah, nice. <clears throat> I really appreciate that um, you drew the you closed up the gap about um, historical Buddha and us now. That part really is key to my... It's, it's just amazing for, for me because I've always felt somehow disconnected, even though I've done my pilgrimage, I've tried to, to, to understand, but sort of bringing back what is Buddha in... You know, um, you, you mentioned about how you took care of a, a sick monk and all those. Actually, just now I tried to read through the whole thing and it's sort of bring it back to such a human form. And he is really, really there for us. And now, um, now when I read the sutta, I, I try to, in part, to say that, think, think about he, he was thinking about us and to read that kind of um, whatever he said with compassion and not just like a very literal sense. Yep. You know, have, have that understanding. So I, I take away that okay. very, very okay, great. Uh, Wonderful. Yeah. Nothing to uh, no feedback. Yeah. No complaints. Yeah. No, okay. <laughs> yeah. Hi, Ajahn. Um, I've attended your sutta for a few years now. I think this, uh, this time around, it ignited the, a bit more interest in the sutta. And you have been able to make Sutta easier to comprehend for newcomers. I'm still a newcomer after despite so many retreats, right? <laughs> Sorry to say that, not being a good student. But I think condition has changed and there's certain maturity. And how you have made it easy is, I know there's a mix of those who are very expert in Sutta and those like me. So there are mixtures of mine here, but you also make attempt to explain in layman term, layman English, which really helps. So um, just one request, you, you notice I have my iPad here. It's like when so, you, I have my iPad here, so ah, Sean, ah, when ah, you're going through yeah. the, the sessions, is yeah. there's a lot of Pali words that you mentioned, right? Yeah. I'm not sure. So we were trying to figure out how to spell certain words that I just, <laughs> just mentioned, okay. just to get closer yeah. to it. But of course, um, many of the time we miss out but there are a few times we managed to catch it and, and note it down. Yeah. Uh, so even like, you know, great aversions, delusions, what moha, those are, um, I also like just catch it at this, this session. So yeah, yeah so I, I know it's not easy because you have a mix of mind here that's very, very knowledgeable and so time, that's very basic one. So I really appreciate that because I try to attend certain sessions by other uh, wise uh, practitioners, but it, it it's much more difficult to grasp because to them it's like those are basic Pali words, so there's yeah. no um, you know no explanation. So okay. yeah, there's no right or wrong. So, but it's okay. just, this is really very good. So okay. thank so, you. Very so, much. so what you're saying is that you would like me to be more careful with explaining the Pali words. Is that what you're saying? So um, kind of more. Uh, 
If yeah. I can. Uh, if you can, if, you can, can. if okay. conditions okay. permit. Okay. I'm, I'm, <laughs> okay, that's really <laughs> And you know, positions to us are just to be more yeah. careful. Yeah, I mean, no. you are, you're just being very humble, uh, right? Yeah. But to it's me, good. it's really very good. But mm. because you're asking for feedback, so that's the. Yeah, the Mobi is asking for feedback. But anyway, I'll, I'll take, I'll take uh, it anyway. <laughs> So thank you no, very much for yeah. the appreciation. Right. No, thank you for the feedback. I appreciate yeah. that actually. It really That's helps. Good. Thank yeah. you. Excellent. But you, one thing that you have made yeah. to me, Sutta is like rocket science. <laughs> but now you have made it simpler and easier to kind of comprehend. It's, it's chewable. So at least now I have better lights in the tunnel yeah. to pave my, my journey in, okay. into Sutta. Okay. Thank you very much. Great. Excellent. So that was harder. I mean, will, will it help if, if the uploader videos are annotated with the party terms? Okay. Oh, right. yeah, okay, yeah. <laughs> Good then. Yeah, maybe one more, then we can uh, hand it over to Bobby, Master Bobby. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Dr. Lina, okay. Uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, it's not uh, my place to give feedback to Ashar. So I just took this opportunity to just thank him from the bottom of my heart. Um, it's not, he makes uh, Sutta life, come alive for all of us. There's no doubt about it. Uh, what we, uh, what is very endearing and very helpful is that uh, we can actually use these teachings in our daily life. It actually makes us uh, conduct our life in the way uh, that you would like us to do. So extremely thankful for you. We don't have words to uh, thank you enough. Um, I, I just took the phone from you to say that I've been, I've been a member of many Buddhist societies. Uh, this is the first time I've come to the Malaysian society. And I really want to thank you all from the bottom of your, my heart. You've been all so welcoming, so kind. I've never met such a lovely, lovely association of people. Uh, I'm really uh, thankful for making it so lovely and so such a warm welcome that you gave me and such a lot of support that everybody has been giving me. Uh, it, it's your kindness really touches my heart. So thank you, Ajahn, and thank you all of you very much for your help and your support. Thank you. Thank you, Brother Niwan. Thank you, Ajahn, uh, Aya. Let's uh, give gratitude to uh, our teacher, the Buddha, and uh, Ajahn Brahmani for conducting the retreat. Yeah. And uh, if during the retreat you have uh, done any uh, <clears throat> offend the Achan in any way by thought words or deeds, we ask for your forgiveness. Uh, same with Aya. Okay. Ask for forgiveness. Okay, so yeah, forgiveness is. Uh, I always like to say that it's always the nice people who ask for forgiveness. The ones who really need forgiveness, they never ask for forgiveness. So. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, I forgive you. Please forgive me in return. I've been talking the most. So. <laughs> Thank you. Now, yeah. we would like to uh, extend our appreciation to a few of the volunteers before we have our. Group photo. Uh, <clears throat> first, uh, we like. To, please be on your seats. Sorry. <laughs> we, we, we'd have to pay respect to the Buddha Dhamma Sangha at some point. Yeah. So maybe yeah, after at, you. At the end. After this end. Okay. Yeah, just appreciate yeah. the audience. Yeah. The volunteers. Uh, I'd like to appreciate Sister Chi Huang for the breakfast dana. Please, <laughs> please stand up and uh, be recognized. Oh, oh. Then, uh, Sister Dan. Dolitio for the lunch dana for our chan and the Aya. <coughs> sister Juyang is assisted by uh, Wayin Linda Yi also. And uh, our sister for coffee for our chan. <laughs> <laughs> Siu Ling for lunch and tea breaks, assisted by Sister Siu Lian, Bibuan, and uh, Jennifer Wong for our registration team. Brother Lai is floor manager and Kapia, and uh, Brother Ang for the recording and technical support. And uh, Sister Wayne for formatting the notes. Also, we have many generous sponsors for the participants for lunch this year. Uh, today's lunch was sponsored by Sister Linda Yi, Ibuan, and uh, Mary Hong. Linda? Today's lunch was uh, very exceptional. Yeah. <coughs> So the past few days were also sponsored by various sponsors which uh, we have recognized. Now many of you have also donated very generously over and above the stipulated amount. 
Masadu to all of you. All the donations meant for Bodiana will go directly to Bodiana. And the other collections after expenses, 70% will go to Bodiana and the remaining 30% to support BGF maintenance and overheads. Okay. So sadhu to all of you. Ah, sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Now there is a Chinese saying that uh, when you drink water, think of its source. Would you not like to know how these uh, Sudan retreats came about? Yeah, it all began 10 years ago in 2015 when uh, Sister Chui Huang came back from Perth after attending a chance uh, Sutta retreat. So she told me very excitedly that how she benefited her and uh, she asked me to bring Achan over every year. So the, the best part was that she... Actually, uh, Bert, Bert told me, you all better book Achan. Many people are waiting to fight you. Yeah. <laughs> Ask BGM to book first. That's a message that must be. Yeah, luckily we, we did that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and uh, to the... To allay our fears of uh, whether we can cover the overheads, Sister Chui Huang offered to sponsor Achan's air flight every year, and which she has been doing every year. Uh, sadu, sadu, sadu. Except for one year by Sister Linda. Uh, so, and also, the uh, we have all learned a lot this year uh, from this retreat. And uh, if you like the opportunity to serve the community, the Sangha, uh, we offer you a lot of opportunity here at BGF. BGF acts as a, a center where monks from SBS and many other centers come when they come over to renew their visas. They stay here for a few days or a few weeks. So it's an opportunity to provide transport to the monks, to offer dana to the monks. So if you like to join our dana team or our transport team, contact me and give me your contact. I will add you to the groups. Okay. If we have a large pool of people, then we don't have to tax the same people too heavily. Right? If many people are offering transport, then we can spread it out. Same for Dana. So uh, it is always a you get a lot of happiness from serving the uh, the monks. Believe me. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So uh, now we have a like a chance to share merits and then after that we have a group photo. Yeah, we share the merits and then we pay the respect to the yeah. Buddha Masanga. Yeah. So, so after that, we have a group photo in front. Yeah. So let's just do the um, traditional sharing of merits first of all, and, and then we will do the uh, final homage to the Buddha Masanga after all. So it's always nice on a retreat like this, we always do make a lot of, do a lot of good things. So it's a great opportunity to share the merit with the ancestors. So here we go. Tayo Sadu Sadu Sadu. Okay, let's pay homage to the Buddha Masanga. Arang Sama Sam Buddha Bhagava Buddha Bhagavan Tang. Abeva demi Svaka to Bhagavata Dhammo Dhammang Namasame Supati Panno Bhagavato Savaka Sangha Sangang Namami. <laughs>